Okay, hello everybody. Thanks for coming. It's been a long conference, but it's been really great. Uh, so yeah, I'm going, so I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Waterloo. Uh, and we work with these nanowire quantum dot uh, photon sources. And uh, this is just a little schematic of like, we get two photons out and this is the reconstructed density matrix we get, uh, which I'll get to later in the talk, but yeah. So uh, the first I'm going to motivate why we want to use semiconductor quantum dots uh, to produce uh, quantum sources of light. I'm going to then talk about some of the challenges that have faced these sources in, in the past. Um, and then what we've done to kind of try and overcome them a little bit uh, by mostly improving the experimental conditions we use to measure uh, the samples. And then I'm going to conclude and discuss you know, where we are with the state of the art and where we need to be moving forward. So the motivation here obviously is we know, uh, you know entangled states of light are a useful resource for a number of different applications. Um, I think for our sources, the quantum networks are an interesting one um, for doing things like entanglement swapping. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, so that's, I think, uh, the motivation on that side. Now, in order to actually produce entangled photon pairs, they need to have certain properties. Um, and the first sort of two that are interrelated is obviously the if we're talking about bipartite entanglement, the two photons need to uh, have uh, quantum correlations between them. Um, and then likewise, the two signals that come out from your source, they should be pure, which basically means they should be single Fox states. Now, the nice thing about quantum dots is that they allow you to do this on-demand um, uh, uh, source or generation of light, which means that every time you ask for a uh, entangled photon pair, you should get one at a well-specified point in time. And then obviously your source should be bright, which means it has a fast repetition rate uh, and a high efficiency so that you can get as many, uh, as much light out as possible. And then obviously there's other uh, properties that matter as well, such as indistinguishability. Uh, I'm not going to touch on those there. We can talk about that later if people have questions. Um, so the current state of the art is uh, spontaneous parametric down conversion uh, for producing entangled photon pairs or other nonlinear processes. Now they, as we have heard many times, have uh, Poissonian statistics, and so they struggle to meet this on-demand um, sort of uh, bar. Uh, and then uh, similarly, they have this issue where if you try to increase the amount of photons you get per second, you start to see uh, a reduction in the entanglement fidelity. And this dotted curve here is sort of the theoretic, theoretical maximum you can get uh, between a relationship and entanglement fidelity and the pair extraction efficiency, which is basically the probability of getting both uh, parts of the entangled pair out at the same time. So one question is how can you go beyond this limit and get to this on-demand region and the answer uh, is to try and build a proper two-level quantum system um, where you can excite to, from a ground to an excited level and then decay and have light come out uh, that way. And one uh, possible way to build such uh, two-level systems is to use semiconductor quantum dots. Um, so now on the slide here, I just have some uh, points where the, you know, which were state-of-the-art uh, quantum dot sources, uh, and they have now sort of slowly moved up. So here you're reaching over 97% uh, fidelities. Uh, and here you have very efficient sources, which are quite recent, but you can sort of see a general trend in these quantum dots that we're slowly moving towards this uh, region. So just quick background. So we uh, deal with semiconductor quantum dots in photonic nanostructures, and there's a variety of different types of these. Um, but the general idea is you confine, uh, you make a confining potential for your electrons. So you produce um, single energy states uh, for electron and holes to occupy. And then you control the electromagnetic environment around your emitter so that you stop spontaneous emission into modes that you don't want. Uh, most notably, you know, if you just place an emitter in bulk here, you have emission in all directions. If you place your emitter in some type of waveguide or 
similarly a cavity, then you stop uh, emission into these modes that you can't easily couple to externally, and you get most of your light going in, so, say, at the up or down direction here. And with uh, modern semiconductor growth techniques, you can generate structures which combine both of these together. So here are just some images of our nanowire samples. Um, and they're basically, you know, the quantum dot sits inside of the core of this nanowire waveguide, which is I think run, roughly 250 nanometers wide. Um, and you can see here, this is the atomic concentration. You can see that the, clearly you, you move from indium phosphide, which is the nanowire core, and you slowly add arsenic until uh, you get this sort of almost uh, parabolic-like potential. And by controlling the height and the width and so on, you can control how many energy levels exist. And then I wanna just point out that the end of the nanowire is tapered. And that means that when the light gets coupled into the fundamental mode of the nanowire, it then will leave and couple easily into free space um, without you know, scattering at the edge. And that can improve our efficiency. So now I'm gonna talk about how entanglement is generated in these quantum dot systems. Um, and the basics is something known as the Bogson exciton cascade. So when you get uh, electron and hole pairs inside of your quantum dot, they form uh, what is known as an exciton and a bi-exciton. Two electron hole pairs is a bi-exciton. And when they fill the top energy level uh, or the energy level of your quantum dot, you basically get a net angular momentum state of zero. So you get an exciton with a net spin of plus or minus one and a plus one. What then happens is when they decay, the angular momentum of the exciton will get passed on to the polarization of the photon that is emitted. And because you need to return to a net angular momentum zero of zero, a net angular momentum of zero at the ground state, you have these uh, distinguishable or indistinguishable pathways which will produce entanglement in uh, polarization degree of freedom. Now, this is for a perfect device where this intermediate level is degenerate. In reality, you get something known as the fine structure splitting. And what that does is it, it lifts the degeneracy of the uh, exciton level, this intermediate state. Uh, and that causes, you know, you're no longer able to really write the eigenstates of the system as R and L. And it's now, you know, this is a superposition state and so if you think about, you know, a plus one uh, uh, um, exciton recombining, you'll get this precession between R and L polarized photons uh, when you look in that basis. In the linear basis, you just see this phase factor that appears. And that basically is telling you that you're going to change between, you know, the, you know, plus psi bell state and the minus psi bell state. So, this, so now I'm just going to talk about, you know, some of the challenges that have faced these systems and a lot of, uh, you know, the concern is around the solid state environment being complicated and messy. You know, you have lots of things going on. There's other uh, atoms in the lattice that can contribute spin noise, which is definitely really bad for us when we care about the angular momentum uh, of the electrons in the quantum dot. You also have free charges uh, and phonons and all these other things. Um, so the question arose, you know, uh, with our uh, sources, we were peaking out at a, a concurrence of 77%. And the question was, why is that? Is that because of dephasing mechanisms? Uh, or do we have to look at other things, most notably the experimental conditions that we're using to measure the light? Uh, and so the three main factors we considered were the detector timing response, the excitation technique, which relates to the multi-photon emission, and the dark count rate. And so the question was, could you predict the reconstructed density matrix just from these three parameters? Um, and it turned out the answer was yes, and I'll get to that in a second. I just wanted to now explain uh, some of these experimental parameters and why they're relevant. So obviously it makes sense, dark counts would be bad. They would produce you know, unwanted correlations uh, in your experiment, which shouldn't be there in the perfect system. Um, and just to show you now, though, that the state of the art single or um, superconducting nanowire single photon detectors have very low dark count rates compared to uh, commercially available silicon APDs. Uh, so that's, you know, one thing you can see to improve your setup is just get lower dark counts. The next is the excitation technique. So there's sort of three. The first one is the most simple. 
you basically excite the nanowire uh, above its band gap around the quantum dot and the free charges that are produced will then decay into the quantum dot and produce your exon and bi-exciton. This produces a lot of extra charge around your quantum dot and so that can easily lead to dephasing. The next technique is sort of a quasi-resonant excitation. You excite um, to these acceptor donor levels, which are closer in energy to the S shell of the quantum dot. Uh, and that means you have less time for decay and you also produce less um, free charge around your quantum dot. The optimal technique for true on-demand um, uh, emission is a resonant excitation technique where you uh, drive this two photon um, absorption uh, from the ground to the bi-exciton state and you're directly populating that bi-exciton state. Uh, and there you're producing no extra charge in the environment uh, and you're also directly populating the state. So it happens basically right away. Now, the last thing I wanna talk about is timing resolution. And so this is something that maybe not, isn't obvious why it matters, but because of the fine structure splitting, because of this oscillating state, it is something that you need to worry about. And obviously the faster the detection, the better. And you can see this order of magnitude improvement from these uh, superconducting nanowire detectors uh, compared to standard avalanche photodiodes. And so now I'm just gonna talk about why, uh, elaborate on this. So, you know, typically when you're uh, doing this in the lab, you're correlating two signals and you get, you know, a coincidence histogram and you're trying to look at how you then reconstruct your density matrix from those coincidence counts. And the way you do that is you just sort of might integrate over a window of those coincidence counts and then run some type of algorithm to reconstruct the density matrix. Now, if you have the fine structure splitting in there and you take a long integration window, you basically start to average out this oscillating phase. Um, and so you get, you know, you slowly move towards like a, a more mixed state and you lose this entanglement that exists, but is sort of time dependent. Um, so this is sort of a well known thing in the field and you can actually model it. Um, basically the faster your lifetime and the lower your fine structure splitting, the better entanglement you get if you take this large integration window. Um, so we sort of said, well, why don't we just take very small windows and calculate the density matrix at every you know, small timing uh, region and then you can get a more accurate view of what it is at each point in time and you sort of just cascade it over until you've covered most of the coincidence counts. Now even if you do this, it's not perfect because the timing resolution of your detector still matters. Uh, if you think about it, your timing resolution will dictate, you know, how accurately you're going to record when a certain polarization was uh, you know, detected. And because it changes in time, you get a, like a blurring effect if it's too slow. Um, and these are just theoretical curves that I've made. Um, so on the right or on the left here is the silicon uh, avalanche photodiodes. And you see that it's a much less sort of abrupt uh, correlation compared to the SNSPDs, where it's much more like uh, before here I had, uh, this was actually a purely if you had perfect timing resolution, like zero jitter. And it looks almost exactly like that. Um, and so with this, with, with these fast detectors, you don't get any of this blurring effect and you can resolve what I would guess you can call the true entanglement of your oscillating state. Uh, and so to talk, to just address the point I made earlier about predicting the density matrix from, um, from just three parameters based off of the excitation or based off of the experimental conditions, we, uh, this was work done in 2019 um, by uh, some of my colleagues. Um, we see strong agreement between the concurrence that we see measured in the lab, which was roughly 0.77, and this red curve, which was the predicted uh, concurrence curve from our model, which only included those three parameters. Now, this was for a quasi-resonant technique, and when you went to non-resonant technique, you saw it slowly you know, dropped and that ex those extra charges likely induced extra dephasing, and so you didn't have a quote-unquote dephasing-free source uh, when you use this non-resonant excitation. Now, the question was, what if you use this model and you elaborated to, you know, using SNSPDs with very low multi-photon emission, uh, and you 
you know, the model sort of predicts, oh, you'll get 99% concurrence. And so the question is, is this true? Can this actually happen? So that's what we set out to do. Uh, so this data here is sort of the first data we've gotten um, with pulsed resonant excitation of our nanowires. So here you can see the exciton and the bi-exciton transition lines. You can see they nicely at the same heights, which is important, which means they're usually generate a bi-exciton, you're also getting an exciton. Here there's just, we're blocking the laser, um, but you can see otherwise a very clean spectrum. So you're basically only getting out your exciton and your bi-exciton. You can see that we're able to drive uh, the direct transition uh, resonantly uh, through these Rabi oscillations from the ground to the bi-exciton state. Uh, and then you can see we're able to achieve pretty good um, autocorrelation results with low, um, so this, this shows uh, low multi-photon emission uh, because of the very low coincidence counts right in the middle. Um, so if we then do these projective measurements in polarization, uh, we're able to see exactly what you'd expect from the theory. Uh, so you see in the HV basis, you basically see just this exponential decay that follows from the lifetime of our emitter. And then in the circular basis, you see this oscillation between, you know, RL and LR, which would be, I guess, your plus five bell state. And then down here are our uh, LL, which would be your plus psi bell state. Uh, and then if we just look at the um, uh, single projection curves, you see this nice, again, this nice out of phase relationship that looks very much like the theory um, as a function of the time delay. And so now to the meat, which is uh, the concurrence. So we are able to measure very high concurrence right at the beginning of our, uh, um, uh, right at the beginning of the correlation uh, with a peak concurrence of around 95%. So you're able to go from 77% to 95%, basically just by improving the experimental conditions. Okay. Uh, and then you can see it's pretty flat as well. So it, it gets noisier over here because you're getting less coincidence counts um, at you know a long, uh, longer time delay after. The lifetime is roughly 800, 900 picoseconds. So up to the lifetime, that's what I have is this average, you get still get a concurrence over 91% and average fidelity to some bell state, it is changing in time uh, of uh, around 94%. Uh, and then we can reconstruct the density matrix uh, and what it actually looks like. And you can see just visually that it has uh, right at the initial time, it has this very nice uh, uh, HH plus VV character uh, and then if you look at another time later, uh, you see it's, it's more noisy, obviously, there's a lot of these off diagonal component or uh, diagonal components, but you see that the sign here has swapped. So you now have an HH minus VV bell state. Um, and so basically this shows that sure the fine structure splitting changes your state over time, uh, but it doesn't necessarily uh, decrease your, the quality of the entanglement that's present. Uh, so yeah, to discuss, uh, there still needs to obviously be work done. We would like to reach that 99% uh, threshold. Um, and some possible causes, um, you know, from the model, we were, you know, the model assumed zero G2. We were unable to reach zero G2. My hunch, however, is that I don't think even going to zero G2 would fix it. I think either maybe there is some type of spin spin dephasing or there are some other uh, issues that have been brought up in the literature very recently that could be contributing to this, um, such as the AC Stark shift when you're exciting resonantly. Um, so that's stuff to explore in the future. Um, now, the other thing I want to mention is that our source is quite inefficient right now. Uh, it's actually more inefficient uh, than when we had the quasi-resonant uh, excitation technique. So we're only able to extract uh, pair extraction efficiency of less than 1%. Uh, and there's a few reasons that could be contributing to this. Uh, one possible cause I think is the, um, there's a lot of charge built up in the nanowire. And so the uh, S shell, so the bottom energy level of the quantum dot is already full before you try to excite it. And that can sort of artificially block how many pairs you can, or how many times you can actually excite your state. Uh, and this is sort of a thing known in the literature 
uh, and there's ways you can try and get around it. So now to just compare where we are with the state of the art. Uh, so this was our, the, those results from 2019 that I showed earlier. So we've seen a large increase in our entanglement uh, to be sort of on par with some of the other state of the art sources. However, our efficiency is still lacking compared to these sources over here. And so in order to get to this on-demand regime, definitely need to focus on improving the efficiency and then also to beat SPDC sources, which I guess are our main rival, we need to also improve the entanglement. So to conclude, uh, dephasing uh, is, was not causing the large degradations in entanglement that we observed previously. Uh, that, and basically just improving the, uh, just improving the experimental setup, we were able to see a large improvement in the measured entanglement. Uh, and that shows that the experimental conditions are indeed critical. Uh, now, the, this doesn't mean that you know, we have perfect entanglement yet, and our model was probably missing something. And so now we need to figure out what that was. And the last thing I want to say is that the fine structure splitting is probably still an issue uh, for many practical applications, because you usually just want a fixed state that doesn't change in time. You just want some known bell state to come out every single time. Um, and so there are ways to actually remove the fine structure splitting, and that's something we are working on in our lab, and we had two poster presentations here on that. But I mean, I don't know, I'm just throwing it out there. Maybe an oscillating state could be useful for one application or something, I'm not sure. So with that, I would like to thank uh, these fine people. So uh, at our, in our lab uh, here, and my supervisor, Michael Reimer, and then at NRC, uh, the people who actually grow our samples, uh, these very nice nanowires. And then uh, Andreas Fonini at Single Quantum, he was one of the main people who came up with this model uh, for dephasing free uh, entanglement. And then also they supplied us with these excellent single na uh, superconducting nanowire single photon detectors. So yeah, that's, that's everything.